So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you may be based. Uh, welcome to this uh, Fintelect ABA webinar, uh, which is called Crypto 2022 in Review and a look ahead uh, for 2023. Uh, so today, what we're going to cover is some of the key uh, regulatory and enforcement developments that have happened in 2022. Uh, you know, what are some of the main areas of challenges that we see for the crypto industry and, you know, what can we expect uh, to see in 2023? So these are some very broad uh, pointers, but we'll obviously get into some more details. Uh, firstly, thank you so much to the Asian Bankers Association for partnering with Fintlet again uh, this time uh, for, uh, for this uh, monthly webinar. And thank you so much to both our panelists, Calvin Fu and uh, Stephen Pettigrew uh, for joining us today. So, uh, Calvin and Stephen, welcome. Uh, Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Rist. Pleasure to join this session. So, the format for today's webinar uh, is uh, going to be such that we will first have a presentation by Calvin. I think many of you attending in today. Uh, have been watching Calvin as he delivers our monthly update on Fintech Academy. So Calvin is uh, is a known uh, face in the Fintech community. And after Calvin finishes his uh, presentation, we will uh, have a quick chat with uh, Stephen on uh, similar issues. And after that, we will open up for audience questions. So uh, throughout the one hour, whenever any of you have any questions, please keep posting them in the Q&A uh, window as you do every time. And before we start, although uh, you know all of you know Calvin well, let me just say a few words about him and Stephen, so that for those of you who have uh, never sort of met them virtually or uh, in person before know uh, who they are. Uh, so Calvin Koo is a New York and Hong Kong dual qualified cross-border litigator. He's based in Hong Kong. Uh, he counsels financial technology clients regarding cryptocurrency related disputes and investigations. Uh, as well as victims of fraud on international asset recovery matters. Uh, this includes a focus on digital asset tracing and recovery, as well as creative judgment enforcement strategies requiring work in courtrooms and with government authorities around the world. Uh, Calvin is currently a cross-border disputes and investigations lawyer with Cobra and Kim LLP. Uh, so that's about uh, Calvin. Let me also introduce uh, Stephen Pettigrew. Uh, so Stephen advises on financial services and fintech, uh, with a particular focus on digital assets regulation and disputes. He represents leading financial institutions, fintechs, digital currency exchanges, startups and DeFi projects and venture capital funds, and has a rare combination of commercial, legal, as well as entrepreneurial skills. Uh, so Stephen has experience with commercial contracts, corporate law disputes, financial services and crypto regulation, uh, investigations and enforcement. He has advised on fraud investigations, insider trading, market manipulation, theft, mis-selling, governance, and uh, director's duties, AML, CTF, and sanctions issues. So I think, you know, by and large, anything that one can advise on, uh, Stephen has uh, been there and done that. Uh, his uh, experience includes, uh, uh, you know, advising agencies, uh, you know, such as the DOJ, the CFTC, the MASS, HKMA, SFC, and the FCA. Uh, he has also acted uh, on litigation before the UK Supreme Court and in the Hong Kong and Australian courts. Uh, so Stephen uh, trained at a magical a magic circle law firm in London and worked for one of Australia's leading disputes practices before he joined his current company, that is Piper Alderman. Uh, he also has experience as a startup founder and previously ran a Delaware Incorporated Public Benefit Corporation. Uh, he is qualified and has practiced in Australia, Hong Kong, and England and Wales. Uh, and currently is based in Melbourne. So that's uh, those are your panelists uh, for uh, today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we will start with a presentation uh, by Calvin, as I mentioned. Uh, so Calvin, uh, may I request you to uh, uh, start off? Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, sharing my screen, can you just give me a thumbs up if the, my screen is shown? Great. Um, well, thank you, uh, Shrivish. Thank you, Fintelec. Thank you, ABA, for inviting me. Very happy to join uh, this group and Stephen and Shrivish uh, in this webinar. Uh, and thanks also for the kind introduction uh, and reference to my monthly video series, which is posted on Fintelec. So anyone who is already following that, thank you. Anyone interested, please do check that out. Uh, 
Um, for those following it, you'll know that what I try to do is provide updates uh, on the latest sort of crypto news and issues from the perspective of legal developments and regulatory enforcement developments. And so my goal in that series and also today is to provide you with the perspective of what's happening in this industry from that angle. And I think for those of you, I think many in this group are probably uh, have compliance touch points. I hope that this type of information is helpful for devising risk-based programs appropriate for your work uh, and your companies that have crypto touch points. Uh, and then even for others, I hope it's helpful for you to understand how authorities are looking at these issues, um, how they may look to private groups, private industries, private sector for support or comment or guidance on this rapidly evolving uh, and popular technology, uh, notwithstanding crypto winter, which we'll get into. Uh, and uh, and I'll hopefully all of this information will be uh, useful to you. Uh, just before I start, my usual caveat, um, anything I say today is my own opinion, not that of my firm's and I'm not providing any legal or financial advice. Um, so just a quick year in the review, what will we remember from 2022? Um, really the year actually began optimistically, I think, for a lot of crypto enthusiasts. Uh, the mainstream headline news coming out of late 2021 was often just about the high prices of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And although that price started to go down at the end of 2021, this time last year, the price was still about 40,000 uh, US dollars for one Bitcoin. Um, mainstream financial institutions started dabbling. You kept reading stories about how this major international group or this major financial institution was exploring a new product area or starting to put their feet into these products. Um, advertisements with celebrity endorsements were everywhere. You see Matt Damon up here on the screen right now. From a legal and regulatory perspective, although it was still a little too slow for some, we started to see more concrete policy positions, in some cases, even actual legislative action undertaken. Uh, but then came spring 2022, which for crypto was winter, uh, and that's really continued through this day. Um, so we saw business failures, we saw bankruptcies, we saw a lot of key industry players that were inextricably tied to one another, you know, through loans, or financial arrangements. And so much like what happened with traditional finance in 2008, there was a cascading effect that when one company failed, other companies started to fall. And coming out of that, we saw criminal cases uh, and we started hearing uh, and seeing a lot of commentary about how governments might react from a policy perspective. So today I'm not gonna be advocating for any specific policy or any particular approach. Um, as Shirst mentioned at the beginning, I do deal with a lot of crypto fraud matters, but I don't think that the technology itself is fraudulent. Uh, it's just a fact that bad actors often adopt to new technology and adapt that new technology, especially when it's novel and uncertain. Uh, I do think that the technology holds promise, but I have absolutely no idea where it'll end up, you know, a decade from now, et cetera. Uh, same thing if you ask me a question about the internet in the mid 90s, for example. Uh, right now, we're still living in the midst of, uh, you know, sort of the negative 2022 news. I think we'll have a better perspective in a few years where this all leads. But obviously, from a practical perspective, you and your companies can't just sit back and wait for academic reflections. Uh, so what I'm hoping to do is from a legal regulatory enforcement perspective, what did we learn from last year factually? And where will this lead potentially in 2023? So I'll tackle some policy and legal and regulatory issues for 2022, take a quick look at some uh, enforcement cases that I think may have uh, longer term ramifications, and then a, a look ahead at the end. So starting with sort of law and policy, um, I think the big theme that came across from a lot of major financial jurisdictions last year was the idea that these jurisdictions wanted to promote and develop blockchain technology as in their jurisdictions, but to do so, quote, responsibly. So responsible innovation. That was a common buzzword. You can see it used in all three of the jurisdictions on your screen. Uh, and often when you heard speeches or saw policy papers, you would see the acknowledgement of sort of the game changing nature of crypto and related technology in positive ways. Maybe it's helping the unbanked, Maybe it's helping businesses operate more efficiently, or it's just a jurisdiction trying to attract a new industry with the jobs and tax dollars that follow. But then in a subsequent paragraph, 
uh, or in the next section, they would talk about investment risks and risks of scams and hacks and things like that, even uh, before crypto winter started. So we'd start to see a lot of policy papers, consultation periods, um, you know, questions of should we track existing laws, existing securities laws? Should we adapt those slightly? And if so, how? Do we want to follow the Financial Actions Task Force, FATF's guidance? Uh, what should we do? So today, let me examine these three key jurisdictions, looking at the US, just because, frankly, given the size of its market and global influence, tends to have a lot of global ramifications, even if what they do isn't 100% followed. Uh, and then also Hong Kong and Singapore, you know, we're sort of in an APAC uh, webinar right now, and these are two key financial jurisdictions in the region, which took um, notable policy steps this year. Starting with the U.S., and even within the U.S., it's a very diverse jurisdiction in the government, lots of different views, it's not a monolith, uh, but perhaps the simplest way, at least to summarize the Biden administration's perspective, was the March executive order on ensuring responsible development of digital assets. Um, you'll see that in that uh, report or that order, there were six priorities identified, um, and those are on your screen right now. And these are broadly consistent with what a lot of other jurisdictions would say or have said of what they're trying to do, sort of that balance between innovation, but doing so responsibly in a way that protects consumers and investors. Now, when this came out in March, a little bit before crypto winter, uh, the reaction was generally positive because um, leading in, there was a view, at least among some in the pro crypto crowd, or at least a concern that there might be uh, a broader crackdown or, or stronger controls. And then the way this order came off was a little bit more of a deliberate consideration of opportunities and risks. On the downside, critics even then noted still kind of vague on about who's going to regulate and how. And, and a lot of crypto industry players want stability uh, and certainty in, in what the laws and regulations say. So even as the years progressed and more agencies in the U.S. came out with policy position papers, um, it still seemed like the U.S. was short on actual legislation. Uh, indeed, there were and are competing bills in Congress on which agency in the U.S. is even going to regulate crypto, securities regulator, commodities regulator, uh, which one? And what that actually resulted in was law and policy effectively falling into the hands of enforcement agencies, regulation by enforcement, which is not really an ideal way uh, to make law because arguably it's unfair for industry players to only find out they crossed the line after the fact. I'd like to also cover the US Department of Justice's perspective on this. Um, you know, when this came out at first, I thought, well, Department of Justice, criminal prosecutors, going after the bad guys, they might take a harder line. Um, so I was actually pleasantly surprised or interested in the way they framed uh, the issues in their report, which came out in June. Uh, you can see some quotes from that report there. And they said things like, the perceived pseudonymity of crypto uh, cryptocurrencies, excuse me, makes them attractive vehicles for criminals. Uh, and criminal actors leverage the innovation claims of decentralization and anonymizing features of cryptocurrencies to facilitate criminal conduct. So actually right off the bat, some of that language struck me, perceived pseudonymity and claims of decentralization. Um, to me, that was notable because if you go back further a couple of years, a lot of times you would see comments from the authorities saying that there was an unbreachable anonymity or pseudonymity in this decentralized world. Because after all, those are the buzzwords that were surrounding crypto a few years ago. And so when looked at cynically, um, authorities would assume the worst. You know, criminals are using this for all its uh, uh, features that could use it for the worst possible ways or in the worst possible ways. So now with this report, it's clear that the Justice Department knows that that's not quite the reality. Uh, I've discussed this in my video series, but as the Justice Department goes on to say in this report, in some cases, you can actually find out who's behind a wallet or who's behind a transaction especially when the uh, you know, stolen assets flow through centralized third parties, uh, like many crypto exchanges. And indeed, the Department of Justice had a big win early last year in recovering uh, 3 billion US dollars in stolen Bitcoin uh, coming out of the RazzleCon case, which I discussed in a video. 
Um, nevertheless, there are undoubtedly many challenges to combating illicit activities and associated asset recovery projects. Um, this report notes that criminals expose the U.S. and international financial systems to risk from jurisdictions where regulatory standards and enforcement issues uh, are less robust. Um, gaps in anti-money laundering and counterfinancing of terrorism regulatory regimes across jurisdictions create opportunities for criminal actors to engage in what they call jurisdictional arbitrage. Uh, and so their conclusion was that law enforcement does have to focus on how this technology can and is being misused. And then they're going to call and are calling for tools, additional tools and policies that would help mitigate those risks. And then finally, drawing lessons from, tra from traditional finance, they'd also look to industry players, third parties, uh, to help monitor and report and fight those crimes. Moving to Singapore, um, there was actually new legislation or actually a modification of, uh, or sorry, excuse me, uh, an additional part of new litigation uh, legislation covering crypto this past year in the Financial Services and Markets Bill. Um, the new uh, aspect of this uh, crypto regulation was to fill a hole in prior legislation. Previously, operators uh, that were created in Singapore but were carrying out crypto-related activities abroad were not covered under the anti-money laundering requirements under the old bill. So there's a new law that just basically fills that gap and extends the monetary authority of Singapore's power to regulate those activities. I think the more interesting thing that came out of Singapore uh, last year was in October, where the Monetary Authority of Singapore published two consultation papers proposing measures to, quote, reduce the risk of consumer harm from cryptocurrency trading. Uh, and these will be part of its uh, Payment Services Act uh, legislation. That, uh, one of those papers refers to trading in cryptocurrencies as, quote, highly risky and not suitable for the general public. And they're proposing protection measures, including additional risk disclosures to enable retail consumers to make informed decisions about trading, uh, prohibiting the use of credit by retail consumers for trading, and also requiring exchanges to have to segregate customers' assets, among other policy issues. So based on the image popularly presented two years ago, when Singapore was often seen and trumpeted as an ideal incubator for crypto companies, there is a perception that this latest round of uh, proposed measure comes off fairly dour and, and full of cautionary words. And what about Hong Kong then? So a week after that Singapore announcement, the Hong Kong government announced its policy statement on the development of virtual assets in Hong Kong. And it opens by applauding the achievements of the virtual assets ecosystem, talks about how the technology is here to stay, and that there's going to be future opportunities in Web3 and the metaverse, for example. But after a few paragraphs of puffing up, it also acknowledges that there are, quote, considerable risks in uncharted waters. So again, a note of caution, but maybe not as strong as the wording in the Singapore announcements. And then the paper says that the government will adopt the, quote, same activity, same risks, same regulation principle, which basically means that the activity and associated uh, regulations uh, that are used in traditional financial products and services will also be applied to the virtual assets industry. So that would make things like exchanges have, crypto exchanges have the same types of responsibilities as traditional banks, for example. Uh, perhaps notably for those in this group, the exchanges will have to carry out anti-money laundering requirements, uh, counter-terrorist financing responsibilities, and also have investor protection mandates. So this policy statement also opened the door to the Hong Kong market opening to retail investors. And in fact, this has been effectively confirmed just this week by multiple Hong Kong government officials uh, just in the last few days. Uh, for those interested in this sort of comparison between Singapore and Hong Kong, I have more on this uh, in a November video I did last year. So check that out if you're interested. Now, unfortunately, in this uh, brief time, I can't cover all the jurisdictions in Asia. Obviously, every jurisdiction is a little bit different. You know, China has its own unique approach to crypto, banning a lot of facilitation activity and developing its own state-led blockchain network. Uh, Japan last year had a new stablecoin law. Korea has new uh, know your client requirements for exchanges there. Uh, 
Uh, India was developing new crypto tax policies. Indonesia announced a new national crypto exchange. Philippines has become one of the highest volume usage rates of crypto users anywhere in the world. Uh, and Australia, and Stephen might be able to speak to this, I think also wants to be a, a regional innovative hub for, for crypto. I do want to spend a couple of moments on what the Financial Actions Task Force has said. Um, this actually goes back to 2021, October 2021, when they said that they expected regulated entities in the uh, virtual asset space to collect uh, information even when transacting with unhosted wallets. And this is the travel rule, which I think many of you would be familiar with. You know, requiring providers to obtain, hold, and transmit information about the sender and the receiver of transactions, uh, and also report information about that for anti-money laundering compliance purposes. So again, this is much like in the traditional finance world, an attempt to deputize third parties with AML monitoring responsibilities. I guess one of the complications, though, in the crypto world is that trading is not always done through centralized entities. Um, you know, many hold their crypto and transacting crypto using unhosted digital wallets, meaning that those individuals keep custody of their digital assets themselves, and they're not relying on third parties to keep custody of them. And without those third parties in the middle, record keeping becomes a lot more complicated and possibly in some cases impossible if you're not getting any uh, responsive information from the other side. So that raises the question of whether it means that no transactions with un unhosted wallets are allowed. Um, South Korea is dealing with this issue. They say crypto exchanges there must comply with the travel rule uh, for any transactions above 800 US dollars. And then in Europe, um, the European Parliament last year also voted in favor of a bill requiring uh, the travel rule to be followed with no transaction threshold. Then in June of last year, uh, FATF issued a, an update, a targeted update on implementation of FATF's standards on virtual assets. Uh, and the report found that many jurisdictions and many companies have yet to fully ensure implementation of the travel rule. And they say that it's important to do so because it's, it's how they empower private entities to detect suspicious transactions. And on that unhosted wallet dilemma, FATF so acknowledge that different jurisdictions are still deciding what approach to take on this, but they felt that most uh, will be following FATF's guidelines, but they'll continue to monitor how countries are approaching this issue. So maybe a country will come up with a unique and novel situation to overcome this dilemma. Uh, finally, on FATF, it also said that major improvements and moderate improvements are also required on uh, global AML and CFT standards in this uh, crypto context, particularly on assessing money laundering risks and the application of AML preventative measures uh, in this space. And they were also worried about gaps in between jurisdictions that are doing it differently, much like the US DOJ said, because that creates this jurisdictional arbitrage issue that can be exploited by bad actors. Um, so just a couple minutes on uh, enforcement developments that I think may have longer term consequences. The U.S. Department of Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control uh, sanctioned Tornado Cash. Now, the U.S. uses sanctions as really a geopolitical tool. And in this case, it did so because there was an association uh, between North Korea and North hackers allegedly, or hackers allegedly based in North Korea, using Tornado Cash as part of its money laundering efforts. Um, Tornado Cash is a protocol that helps obfuscate the trail of crypto transactions by mixing or tumbling assets in and out, makes it harder to tell which assets are going in and following it as it goes out. Um, notably, the US didn't sanction all mixers or tumblers though, just Tornado. Um, and this is notwithstanding that many in law enforcement and some in the civil recovery asset context view the uh, mixers and tumblers like Tornado as tools that bad actors use, much in the way that the OFAC said that the North Korean hackers were using it. Um, on the other hand, privacy advocates will say, that there are legitimate uses of protocol like this. Um, there may be situations in some jurisdictions where certain political donations, for example, may be disfavored, or users would just rather uh, not have the world know how and when they spend their money. And obviously on the blockchain, a lot of that information is available. So these tools are used to protect the privacy. But going back to the sanctions point that has longer term uh, ramifications, Tornado, 
isn't a company or a natural person. Um, really, it's decentralized protocol, it's open source software. So it's really novel to sanction code, sanction software in this sense. And that's been the perspective of a lot of critics that that's not really sensical or practical. Um, but what is practical in terms of those uh, working in compliance in, in, in this audience? Um, what are you to do, right? So on the one hand, there's a clear sanction here. And I know that many uh, tools that a lot of companies use to monitor sanctions, uh, including crypto transactions, have updated their systems. And this will be flagged if, if anything runs through Tornado. On the other hand, what if you're uh, involved in a situation where your client or customer is an innocent recipient of funds unknowingly that came through Tornado, right? Um, unwittingly tied up in this. How do you deal with that? You know, different companies may have different approaches, but something to consider. Uh, a second uh, enforcement case, uh, also in the US, is from the Commodities Regulator there, the Commodities and Futures Trading Commission, which in October issued an order filing and settling charges against uh, an entity called B0X for US anti-money laundering violations. But at the same time that it did that, it filed an enforcement action against the uh, Uki DAO, O-O-K-I, uh, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization, uh, that was a successor to B0X and operated the same software protocol as B0X. And this, according to the CFTC, meant that it violated the same laws that B0X and its founders did. So for those who may not be as familiar, um, a DAO is, as it says, a decentralized autonomous organization. It's a member-owned community with no central leadership. Uh, members holding tokens can vote on initiatives for that entity. But it's not arguably really like a company or a partnership in its traditional sense, and certainly those involved likely wouldn't see it that way. But unsurprisingly, governments are taking a different view. So again, in this case, B0X transferred control of the protocol that it was running in a centralized sense to, the, to this DAO. But the same protocol that was that led to the CFTC violations was still being run, but now in this arguably decentralized form. The government then alleged that by transferring control to a DAO, what the founders were really trying to do was just make the operations enforcement proof. Uh, however, the CFTC still found that uh, for those participating in the DAO by voting their tokens, they were actually liable for the CFT violations as well. Um, one commissioner in the CFTC publicly disagreed with this approach, um, basically on the regulation by enforcement perspective not being a good idea and that it was unfair for uh, DAO token holders based on governance voting with their tokens to be held liable. Uh, but what ended up happening was on the DAO side, they actually never responded to the complaint. Um, you know, Because in a sense, if there was a group that was deciding to act in concert for the DAO, that just opens the door to the argument that they were never acting in a decentralized way in the first place. They were, as the government alleges, acting in a centralized system, right? And so just this week, just two days ago, the CFTC filed for a default judgment in those proceedings since the, the DAO never responded. So it ends up longer term being a catch-22 here for DAOs, right? Either uphold the decentralized principle, but leaving yourself frankly, at the mercy of the code, even if something unplanned happens and you have no ability to respond to third-party allegations or proceedings, or you step outside of the smart contracts and the code in order to respond and defend yourself, but in so doing, you sort of defeat the argument or the principle that you're decentralized. And then lastly, um, a recent story coming out of New York State just this month Coinbase settled with the New York state regulator there for uh, what it was called significant wide ranging and long standing failures in the company's anti money laundering program, including on KYC due diligence, transaction monitoring and suspicious activity reporting. Uh, they had to pay a $50 million US dollar penalty and invest another 50 million US dollars in its compliance program. The agency said Coinbase wasn't able to keep up with the growth of alerts generated by its transaction monitoring system with a backlog of 100,000 unreviewed alerts by late 2021. And that led to failures to investigate and report in a timely manner as is required by AML laws. 
Um, the agency did, however, credit the company for its remediation efforts, including strengthening onboarding and uh, installing a new dynamic risk rating model. So, oh, and also they added some new senior leadership in legal and compliance. So there may be some lessons learned there for, for industry players. So just wrapping up, where does this take us this year? Um, I think a few things uh, that I'm keeping an eye on. One is where are precedents being set? And just coming out of crypto winter, obviously we're seeing a lot of bankruptcies. These take a long time, uh, but already we're seeing some, uh, or some indications of some laws being set. Uh, for example, um, looking at the Celsius bankruptcy and also what Coinbase said in its 10Q report last May, uh, it looks like the developing position when crypto exchanges or other industry players uh, unfortunately go bankrupt is that any crypto deposited by customers in those exchanges end up being the property of the bankrupt estate. And that leaves customers as unsecured creditors of those estates, um, makes it ultimately a little bit more difficult for those uh, customers to get their money back. Um, now, this doesn't necessarily mean it'll apply everywhere. Um, you know, the different terms of use and terms of service between customers and certain exchanges may affect um, how the outcome plays out. But so far, this is the direction that it's tending. It's really the first few use cases in terms of being tested in courts around the world. Um, second, it'll be interesting to see how different jurisdictions uh, and FATA and, and other policymakers uh, approach DeFi, decentralized finance. Again, these are things that uh, FATF have raised before and other jurisdictions have raised before. Not a great solution yet, like what to do, right? You know, it's, it's all well and good to deputize third parties and centralized institutions. Governments understand that because you apply the traditional finance model. But what happens when there isn't a centralized entity that you can actually um, deputize? Uh, we just talked a little bit about DAOs. What are DAOs to do? How, how do they reconcile their sort of decentralized principle? with the fact that increasingly they're being sued and, and being prosecuted. And then also stable coins. That was a big story, especially coming out of the beginning of crypto winter. Um, you know, are these reliable? What types of regulation, what types of laws will be put in place for those? Um, and then just the last thing to watch, how are industry players gonna respond to all of this? Again, I do think we're gonna see a trend in many centralized industry players towards accepting the need to get licenses in relevant jurisdictions, accepting the need to have more governance, controls, transparency, uh, AML policies, examples from traditional finance. Um, maybe the exchange uh, uh, for doing that is that they then have, you know, it's not a monopoly, but a license that restricts the number of players in that relevant jurisdiction, and that's valuable um, as crypto continues to be used more and more. Um, but then what happens to those who are real sort of privacy advocates and you know decentralization advocates? Are they gonna move more towards DeFi and DAOs and things like that, which then just loops back to the issues I was just raising about how our government's gonna address that. So let me stop there. Happy to answer questions at the end, uh, but uh, hope that was a useful and quick overview. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Calvin, for that uh, very crisp uh, review and for sharing your thoughts. Um, let's now uh, rope in uh, Stephen uh, and you know ask him a few questions. Now, for those of you who joined in a bit late, uh, Stephen Pettigrove is based uh, in Melbourne in Australia, and he is currently with uh, Piper Alderman. Um, I've also posted uh, Stephen and Calvin's LinkedIn um, profile links in the chat box. So uh, feel free to connect with them uh, offline or to know more about them by seeing their profiles. So, um, you know, Stephen, uh, I, I know that Calvin has covered, uh, you know, quite a bit of the background, uh, but obviously, uh, you know, you will be seeing all of this from a different jurisdiction, right? Because Calvin is in Hong Kong, you're in Australia, and possibly, uh, you know, you're also dealing with uh, different customers and, uh, you know, advising different sorts of people. So uh, what would you say have been, uh, you know, the top uh, crypto regulatory and industry level developments, you know, that you've seen uh, in the year gone by? Oh, thanks, Rish. Yeah, look, Kelvin's made a number of great points in his presentation earlier, so I won't um, recover those, but I'll just add a few additional sort of reflections because it's been a, a really busy year. Um, just to pick up on the, the sort of regulatory change point, 
there really does seem to be a, cons a global consensus now, I think, on the need for regulation of crypto assets. And that's despite the crypto winter. I think there's a, a sense that crypto and blockchain in some form is here to stay. What exactly that future look like looks like, I think is still very much under development. But you're seeing, and, and Calvin's presentation picked up on this, action across a broad range of jurisdictions moving towards, if not legislation already, then legislation in the next two to three years. And that's going to be a big driver of change in the industry. Just a couple of additional points to pick up on, on that specifically. The G20 has, has basically said that they're working closely together on um, building consensus around what that looks like. So you, you're potentially seeing some consistency between jurisdictions emerge, although no doubt there'll be some local um, local differences. Um, the EU has agreed its final text for the marketing crypto assets regulation towards the end of the year, and that's expected to be voted on in the next couple of months. Um, and that will, um, it's probably the most comprehensive crypto asset regime that we've seen to date and will, will once it's once it comes into, into force, really put, I think, a flag in the sand. It'll be interesting to see how the market responds to it and whether or not um, that's a that's a favourable reaction and it draws a lot of crypto asset innovation to the EU. It'll be very interesting to watch. Um, to, to take it back to the Australian context, we had a consultation on a cryptocurrency licensing regime earlier in 2022. Um, we subsequently had a change of government and there's now a number of other consultations on foot, including one that will look at um, a token mapping exercise, which is effectively the, to look at this question of, you know, how do we categorize these different types of crypto assets in the market and how should we regulate different types of crypto assets? And that's intended to inform a further consultation on a, a licensing regime towards the end, the end of the year. Um, a couple of other points I would pick up on is that um, you're starting to see the um, debate around crypto assets regulation sort of feed into broader quest policy questions around payments, market infrastructure. And we've seen that in Australia with the government um, announcing a payment strategy review and also kicking off a CBDC pilot, um, which, will, which will be happening in the early part of this year in Australia. Um, there's also broader questions around um, the role of the ASX in Australia after some high profile, uh, that's, our, that's our main stock exchange around after some high profile, basically trading failures. Um, and they're looking at it and the government's looking at issues around competition and market infrastructure, which will also feed into you know, questions around blockchain technology and whether those solutions offer a potential potential way forward. Um, one point Calvin picked up was in, in relation to Tornado Cash. There's been, um, a, a, I think, a, you know, a, a continued growth in issues around financial crime in, in terms of use of um, crypto assets and digital assets at that end. Um, there's some stats in Australia that there was a 270% increase in losses due to cryptocurrency scams in 2021. And I suspect you'd see similar stats um, in, in different parts of the world. That's been a big, uh, and I'm sure for this audience as well, a big focus for um, banks, compliance teams, a big concern because it's starting to impact, I think, on, bottom, on the bottom line for banks. So um, I think everybody's starting to look more seriously at what can be done in terms of um, upping uh, procedures for trying to identify these types of um, risks and, and behaviours. Um, there are a number of notable hacks as well this year in the cryptocurrency ecosystem. I think it might have been even been a record record year for hacks, and that's that's resulted in a, a lot of soul searching. I think generally in the ecosystem and a number of initiatives to try and address some of the security aspects around blockchain. Um, and just finally on institutional adoption as well. I think one thing we saw after the last um, crypto boom, boom um, receded in the last bear market in 2018 was a real drop off in institutional interest. I think this time it's it's really continued throughout 2022, although with a slightly different complexion. So we're still seeing lots of um, pilot projects announced in relation to uh, tokenized tokenization of assets and um, crypto wallets, metaverse projects, those sorts of things. Um, I think there's a recognition this time around that blockchain in some form is here to stay and and I think institutions um, rather than pull back entirely from the scene are just working out how to best position themselves for what the future looks like. Right uh, thanks uh, thanks Stephen for that uh, uh, great roundup. Uh, you know I think these days uh, we can't have any uh, webinar uh, talking about crypto and blockchain and you know virtual assets and related areas uh, without mentioning the FTX collapse, right? Uh, 
So, uh, you know, and I think towards the end of last year, that took a lot of uh, media attention. So, you know, what do you see as, uh, let's say, the long-term uh, industry impact uh, of the FTX collapse? So, I mean, the short-term impact has been a real, I think, crisis of confidence and a further um, reduction in, in volumes in the cryptocurrency trading um, ecosystem. I think long term, I think we're likely to see a hastening of a move towards regulation. Um, we've certainly seen that in Australia. The government responded with an announcement that it was moving up its plans to introduce a cryptocurrency licensing regime for exchanges and custodians to, to this year. We'll see whether or not they end up being able to deliver on that, that pledge. Um, but there's certainly been a lot of blowback from the everyday retail investors who had um, invested substantial funds in these exchanges on promises that they had, so industry-leading risk and, and compliance um, policies, which have, you know, have ultimately turned out not to be the case. Um, so I think there'll be a lot more scrutiny on the industry from that perspective. And ultimately, you know, we end up um, with uh, a licensing regime in various jurisdictions that provides better protection for consumers. One, that'll be good for consumers, but two, hopefully it'll provide a, a, a a framework and a, and a stable foundation for future innovation, because that's been one thing that's really been lacking in this sector up to this point. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of money and people have been sitting on the sidelines waiting for that to happen. So there may be something of a silver lining there, although you know, as Kelvin's highlighted, there's going to be a lot of um, litigation and enforcement action, I suspect, um, as another short term consequence of this over the next couple of years. Right. So uh, how do you see this also impacting, let's say, the global adoption of crypto? Sure. Um, I mean, there's been some bright spots, I think, in the crypto industry in 2022, notwithstanding it's been a pretty bleak year generally. Um, DeFi is one area where um, where things have held up, you know, reasonably well. Total volumes locked in DeFi have dropped significantly because of the drops, it, drop in asset prices. But unlike in the context of the you know, the FTXs and Celsius of, Celsius of this world, um, we haven't seen any major DeFi protocols fail. Um, and that's partly a feature of the, you know, the way that they're structured and based on smart contracts and collateralization, um, meaning that you know, when those asset prices dropped, assets were liquidated and, and you know, liabilities were met. So well, that's been, a, I think, a bright spot and, and perhaps has um, you know, made the case that many of the sort of hardcore crypto advocates will say that you know, these trustless and decentralized systems you know, have a potential future. So that's that's interesting. I think a big driver over the next couple of years, as I sort of touched on earlier, will be regulation and that and a regulatory regime in a number of uh, countries around the world could really set the foundation for further innovation and development. And then another area which we're watching closely in Australia as well is the sort of stable coins and CBDCs area. And that that's an area which um, central banks in a number of countries have identified as an area of potential promise. So you have the RBA, which is our central bank in Australia, um, particularly pointing out stable coins as a, you know, as a, as a potentially good um, contribution to the payments ecosystem and looking generally at where stable coins fit in that, in that future. Um, I think CBDCs as well also um, hold the promise of potentially moving a whole lot of uh, trade and transactions onto blockchain technology if they're ultimately widely adopted. And you know, what's really interesting about the CBDC um, aspect is there's a real geopolitical sort of driver there with a number of jurisdictions competing. And you've seen was the ECNY in, in China. Um, it gets into sort of fundamental questions around you know, ge geopolitics and global economic positioning and, and some of that competitive, those competitive juices, I, I think, between different countries will potentially lead the way there in ushering in um, new technology that may ultimately have you know, second order consequences in driving the adoption of digital assets. Right. So, uh, uh, Stephen, you know, a large number of our uh, audience uh, that attends these webinars typically is, uh, you know, represent regulated entities. So, you know, it could be banks, financial institutions, uh, you know, casinos, DNFPBs, uh, anyone who's a regulated uh, entity. So, you know, for their benefit, I mean, what would you say are some of the, um, let's say, prominent money laundering or terrorist financing typologies in crypto, uh, you know, that they should consider when they are monitoring their customer transactions? Sure. Uh, yeah, this is an area I think has been of increasing concern. And as I mentioned earlier, the cryptocurrency scams and financial crime in relation to digital assets is 
is starting to hurt the bottom line for a number of institutions. And so um, some of the, the typical ty typologies that we um, generally see is so customers who don't fit the usual profile of a cryptocurrency trader or, or investor. Um, so, you know, potentially older or vulnerable customers who, when questioned, don't really understand exactly what it is that they're investing in or the, or the technology that they're investing in. Um, some of the typical kind of financial crime indicators like unusual transactions, you know, sudden movements of large volumes of cash into you know, cryptocurrency exchange or other, um, other centralised venue. Um, the purpose of the transaction, so if the customer's unclear exactly what the investment opportunity is that they're pursuing, um, uh, whether it's vague or potentially they're, they're trying to very urgently move funds that say are time sensitive, which might be an indication of um, a potential scam sitting behind that, that investment opportunity. Um, uh, indications that the customer is being coached or told what to do um, or acting on you know, the instructions of a third party and moving, moving funds into digital assets. Um, and also connections to high risk jurisdictions. Um, so trying to send funds to a, say, a cryptocurrency exchange in the Seychelles or, or, or somewhere like that. So there's a lot, I mean, the, the, the positive news here is that there's, there's a lot of tools now out there as well that I think can help, you know, and in the cryptocurrency ecosystem, um, there's a number of uh, blockchain analytics firms that really have quite powerful tools to try and identify exchanges or institutions that are at risk um, and potential, uh, you know, patterns of activity that are that are risky. So um, that's certainly something that we we hear clients um, sort of increasingly looking at um, as they try to combat some of these risks. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Stephen. So uh, you know, to end uh, our discussion, uh, Stephen, and uh, you know, Stephen, what would you say are what is your outlook for twenty twenty three? I think Calvin also had one slide on that, and uh, it's possible that there could be some overlap. But uh, what would you say is you know, your own outlook for 2023 in the sector. Yeah, absolutely. And Calvin made a few good points there. I'd also say that, you know, regulation is going to be a big trend in 2023. We're most likely to see the market in crypto assets um, uh, legislation in the EU approved in the next couple of months that would then enter into force in 2024. And I think that will kind of set the race in a number of other jurisdictions for getting their house in order in terms of um, legislation. Whether we'll see legislation in the US and Australia this year, I think there's still some question marks around that. Obviously, Hong Kong has passed its bill towards the end of last year. And, and you know, in the middle of this year, that regime will come into force as well. Um, and you may see some, some activity in Singapore also. So that will certainly be a theme to watch. And hopefully, we'll see some substantive movement this year, um, which I think you know, many, both in the industry and outside the industry, have been waiting for. Um, in terms of enforcement activity, we certainly noticed in, in Australia an uptick in enforcement activity in relation to digital assets generally towards the end of last year with a particular focus on um, uh, finance or, or products that look a lot like financial products, so um, so-called earn or staking type products. Um, I think we'll see more of that and we'll probably see more action as well generally in relation to fraud and you know, market manipulation. Uh, I think the, the FTX trial for Sam Bankman Fried is scheduled for October this year, which will no doubt be a blockbuster and we'll see many more revelations, I suspect, um, over the next nine months in relation to that and sort of uh, connected projects as well. Um, we'll be also watching for, um, I think, more, more signs of institutional either adoption or integration. So uh, I think many, as I sort of touched on earlier, I think there's still many institutions are, are exploring themes like tokenization. Um, and as we move toward a regulatory environment, they'll also be looking at other ways that they can leverage these uh, still you know, high growth and high growth potential um, verticals. And, and, and that also touches not just on finance, but potentially broader Web3 applications like gaming, NFTs, ticketing, social media, et cetera. Um, and I think Calvin touched on this as well, but stable coins and CBDCs will certainly be one to watch. The New York Fed has announced the CBDC pilot. Australia will, has one this year. There's a number of other projects ongoing globally. And uh, just the final one I'd touch on before we open it up for questions is, I, I think you'll see a continued interest in this sector from startups and, and venture capital. There's a lot of um, projects which still have substantial runways of two or three years to run um, and a lot of venture capital that was raised during the last bull run that still needs to be deployed. So while we see some of that capital sitting on the timelines, on the sidelines for the time being, um, I think that the market over, you know, that, that capital will move somewhere and the incentives 
um, underpinning this ecosystem is still very strong. So uh, I'm sure we'll see more activity in in terms of building this year. Thanks, Rish. Fantastic, uh, fantastic, Stephen. So, uh, Calvin and Stephen, uh, thank you so much for joining uh, today and sharing your thoughts. I think we will close the webinar now. It's been uh, fantastic having you both. Uh, audience, thank you so much for listening in. And uh, uh, my sincere thanks to the Asian Bankers Association again uh, for partnering with us uh, for this webinar and you know making it so popular and getting so many uh, people uh, registered and logged in for this. Uh, today's Friday. I think in most parts of Asia now, it's time to hit the pub. Uh, so Stephen, we won't keep you too long. Uh, and everyone have a good weekend and see you at the next webinar. Thank you for having us.